If you have already completed other parts of the Access Truth resources, and we hope you have at very least been through modules one and two, you will know that we are very consciously trying to present a cohesive picture of God as author. Hopefully that has come out clearly as we've followed his narrative and seen him at work in creation and as he's interacted with that creation, especially with his image-bearing race. Implicit in the metaphor of God as author is the concept that he doesn't act randomly or arbitrarily. And even though he is responsive, this does not mean that he is reactive in the sense of being dictated to by circumstances or by the actions of others. He is the initiator and what he initiates or creates is according to his plan and perfectly aligned with his being, his character. In this module, 7, we want to introduce a picture of the church and churches that fits very clearly with this view of God as author. We believe and want to clearly demonstrate that he has carefully planned his church in a way that is consistent with who he is and the way he has always functioned. He has specific intentions for each local church that are intended to play a unique and indispensable part in his overall plan. He puts within those local churches people with the gifts and abilities to do what he wants that church to do within its local context and beyond. Before we go any further, we should probably take a moment to define this term we're going to be using a lot in these tutorials, church. Our Western history has embedded a number of meanings into the word church that are not necessarily helpful. English dictionaries commonly include these definitions. A building for public worship. In other words, they renovated the church. Uh, another one, the clergy or officialdom of a religious body. The church laid out its doctrine. Uh, a third one, a body or organization of religious believers. Uh, it's on the church website. A fourth one, public worship. They attend church on Sundays. And finally, the clerical profession. In other words, uh, he went into the church as a career. In these resources, when we talk about the church, uh, big C, we're referring to all those who've trusted Jesus as their saviour in the period between the day of Pentecost and the future day when we're reunited forever with him. This is the group or body that the New Testament writers usually call the ecclesia, it's sometimes spelled with a, a K, a term borrowed from Greek culture for a gathering or assembly of people who'd been called out from their normal activities for a specific purpose. And when we speak of a church, small c, we're referring, of course, to a specific group or body that is part of the universal church or ecclesia, still a gathering or assembly of called out people, but in a specific place and a particular time. So by church, we are not referring to a building or a group of officials or something that someone goes to or does on a particular day. Hopefully this amazing thing that we're struggling to describe here in words or propositional terms will continue to emerge much more clearly as we look at it in narrative terms, in the way God has actually brought it into being, given it life and interacted with it and equipped it and expressed his love toward it and given it purpose. Because when we spend too much time defining the church in bulleted points, it tends to flatten it out and make it seem like something cold and theoretical. So even though we will sometimes define things about the church and its purpose conceptually, we don't want to ever lose sight of the reality that for God, the author, this whole subject is very, very uh, real and, and personal, even, can we say, emotional. But more about that soon. So God, the author, has carefully laid out the plot for his real-life narrative of how history will play out 
And he's arranged it so that most of this last period we're in now is the time of the church. There are, of course, other ways of describing this period since Pentecost. It is the time of grace and the time of the New Testament or New Covenant. But the thing that God is doing right now is completing his church. One of God, the author's favorite metaphors that he uses in his narrative to describe his church is that of a building. More specifically, it is a temple that is being built. This, of course, ties into the enormously important narrative threads from the Old Covenant with its tabernacle and later temple in Jerusalem. When Jesus came to the earth and died and rose again, the Old Covenant with its priesthood and uh, the sacrifices, the temple, uh, that was fulfilled and superseded, something the book of Hebrews, of course, makes very clear. And now the Spirit of God is living in his people. In the first of Paul's letters to the believers in the southern Greek city of Corinth, he challenges the ecclesia, the church, to live in light of the reality that they are God's temples. This is in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 10 to 17. A few years later, he extends the image when he writes to the believers in Ephesus, famous for its temple to the goddess Artemis in uh, Ephesians 2, 20 to 22. He says that all believers are God's house, a holy temple for the Lord and a, a dwelling place where God lives by his spirit. This building is structurally bound together by Jesus himself and is being built on the truth foundations about him that he revealed to us through his designated storytellers, his apostles and prophets. Picturing stone masons uh, carefully choosing and, and shaping and placing individual blocks into a public building, Paul says that we are each being added into God's temple like that. So this careful building process is what God is fully committed to in this time of history. And he's doing it, of course, in a way that is perfectly consistent with who he is. All the things about him that he shows us through his written narrative are also playing out in this time through the building of the church. When you stop and, and, and think about that, it's absolutely astounding. In fact, Paul, the former Pharisee who was recruited so dramatically by Jesus himself for his cause, calls it a mystery, a mysterious plan. It's not a mystery in the sense of, of something unknowable. God did reveal this plan to Paul and the other apostles, as he said in his letter to the believers in Ephesus. Uh, that's in Ephesians chapter 3, uh, verses 3 to 10. And in the capital of the empire, Rome, this is in, in Romans uh, chapter 16, verse 25. It's also because it is something that is in the process of being demonstrated more fully each day. It's a mystery in that sense. It's, it's being revealed each time God's truth penetrates a, a human heart or a new community. When someone listens to his narrative and believes it instead of their own story, uh, when they respond in faith and his spirit joins them to the ecclesia, when a scattered group of believers in a town begin to come together to worship him, uh, when his word is translated into a language that speaks right to the heart of his people, uh, when his children submit to the authority of his word, when a when a worldview assumption is realigned to his absolute truth, when someone takes on the task of discipling a younger believer, or when his children are willing to sacrifice and even suffer to share the good news with someone or to make it available in a new area, this is the mystery of the church being revealed. The narrative of who God is being written in the hearts and lives and gatherings of his children. And why is he doing this? Why does he choose this means for writing this latest installment of his great narrative? Paul gives us the answer in what he wrote to the Ephesians. Uh, he's using the church, he says, to display his wisdom in its rich variety. As God's spirit gives life 
and all the necessary resources for his church to survive and grow, God's glory is reflected and made known to everyone who sees this happening, both now and also outside the bounds of this physical world. When God's purposes are achieved through his image bearers who were corrupted by sin, but now are new creations because of Christ, that demonstrates just how amazing he is. And when his people unite their hearts in praise, their wills come together to please him, and their efforts to achieve his purposes, then it becomes an amazing picture that even the most powerful spirit beings can only wonder at. But this is not something that God achieves by just doing it to the church. Amazingly, he chooses to involve us, his church, his churches, and his people in the process itself of building his temple. Again, this fits with a thread we've traced through the narrative, an extension of who he is. He chooses to involve, even to work as partners or co-workers with people who will humbly follow his lead. He never abdicates responsibility. Oh, you just do how you see fit. He doesn't do that. Through the narrative with Adam and Eve, with Abraham and Moses, uh, the craftsmen who built the tabernacle and the temple, uh, with the kings of Israel, even with the Lord Jesus himself, God has always been directly involved, clearly stating how things should be done so they line up with who he is, and then giving the patience and the strength and the wisdom and so forth to get the job done. And it's a genuine collaboration. He wants his human co-workers to use their minds, their time, uh, their money, energy, their wills, to really give themselves as wholeheartedly to the task as he does. So God is indeed building his church, but he invites us to be vitally involved in the building project. And because, as we've noted, he's following a design that in every way reflects who he is. We have a responsibility to, one, understand that design, and, and two, to work accordingly. This is something that hasn't always been sufficiently appreciated in the church, even by those who are committed to being involved in sharing the gospel with others. The Lord's Apostle Paul was one who obviously did have a real vision for this, this clarity and the care that should characterize our participation in God's building of his church. As we followed the Acts narrative, we saw this come out in the way Paul approached his role of planting and strengthening churches in places like Antioch and Thessalonica, Ephesus and, and Corinth. In the letters Paul writes to the individuals and local fellowships, it becomes even more obvious that he is working according to a blueprint that God's Spirit was showing him. And he uses this imagery specifically within the church in Corinth, describing them as God's building project that he, Paul, as an expert carpenter, began right at the foundations. This is in uh, 1 Corinthians 3, 9, and 10. Anyone else contributing further to this project, he warns, needs to be careful that their work lines up with the foundation that is Jesus Christ himself. The intention of this module, number seven, is to bundle together key narrative threads that run all the way through God's word and then label them, if you like, in ways that help us to understand more about how God's, God works. As we'll see in the next tutorial, this is not so we can pretend we totally understand all there is to know about the wonderful mystery that is his church. Nor do we want to reduce to theoretical formulas something so precious to him as his body and his bride but to really contribute something of lasting value to his building means investing our whole being like God does. It involves, as we've said, our wills and emotions, but it also requires that we engage our intellects, our minds, and to ask him to give us real clarity and insights 
so that we can be adequately equipped as his building co-workers.